Hello everyone, Harley here. The show that you are about to listen to is the inaugural episode of PVM Perspective, the newest podcast from RuneScape Weekly. This show is hosted by David and I. We have been working on it for a few months and I am extremely excited that you are about to be able to listen to the first episode. With this show, we are also running a fundraiser to help with production. I covered the details of the fundraiser on our last episode of RuneScape Weekly, but if you didn't hear it or would like a breakdown that you can look at and read the details of you can find that at runeweek.com if you would like to donate please go to tip.runeweek.com and do so and thank you very much to everyone who has donated already and here's the show i'm harley i'm david welcome to pvm perspective a podcast about getting the most out of runescape pvm this episode, we are going to be talking about 120 Slayer and how to get there before the release of Menafoss. As many of you know, Menafoss will bring about the introduction of 120 Slayer, which is going to be the first legacy skill in RuneScape to be brought to 120. The reason I personally am working towards getting 120 Slayer and having it early is I'm hoping that it will open up money-making opportunities when the skill comes out with things potentially like new weapons, things like that. Jagus has not really said much about what we're going to get, but that is a goal and a hope of mine that we will be getting. When min-maxing Slayer, the XP and hour potential is actually far greater than most people realize. And in this show, we hope to give you the knowledge to reach those potentials. There is also a chance that at the release of 120 Slayer, XP rates may be worse than they currently are. Jagex has already moved such methods as air roots after fixing the melee only spawning bug that they had for a long time on Mazcap. Alright David, so the first section we have here to talk about is time management and I'll kind of hand it over to you as to what you wanted to say here. Yeah, so I think that one of the most important things when uh, min-maxing a skill is calculating efficient GP per hour. Oftentimes people will choose slower XP methods that use less money. Uh, or require less resources, oftentimes uh, this ends up being less efficient in terms of GP per hour. And there's kind of a handy calculation uh, that many people use to figure out what their efficiency rating is or what the efficiency rating is for uh, different uh, tasks or different skills. Um, And so essentially what you need to do is, in order to calculate your efficiency, you do the following. You take the value of your time per hour. So for example, if you do lots of Vindicta, for example, like I know Harley does, and I'm not exactly sure how Harley would value her time per hour Vindicta, but say it's five mil per hour. So it's you about, would put it's, it's with rare drops it's about nine mil an hour most of the time, but without rare drops five it's about right. Sure. So, and you can kind of figure out whether where you want to to put your GP per hour there. Maybe it's five. Maybe it's nine. Maybe you know you want to be a little conservative, so you put seven. But whatever it happens to be, and and it's different for for different people. Obviously, for some folks, it could be fifteen mil an hour if you're really good at Telos. For some people, it could be three or four mil an hour if uh, if, if if that's what your your target is. But either way, you do that. You subtract the profit per hour of the money-making method that you are considering. Obviously, there's a chance that this profit will be negative, and so you just make the the number negative there. And um, then you divide it by the XP per hour that you're getting, and that sort of gives you your uh, your efficiency number for whatever that skill is. So you take your, your what your time is worth, you subtract that by how much you're getting or losing from the activity that you're about to do, and you divide that by whatever the XP is from the method that you're going to be doing is. And then you could use that to kind of figure out how efficient the method you're going, you're going to be doing. So essentially, the way you could figure out whether what you're doing is efficient or not is that if you, if the number ends up being where if you were to simply spend, say, one hour doing whatever your max GP per hour method is, and one hour doing an extremely efficient method that costs a lot of money. Oftentimes, if you spend your two hours combined, one making money and one spending a lot of money for a lot of XP, 
oftentimes that'll take less time than the method that you would save a lot of money or use a lot less money, but cost you more time. Uh, and, and I, so, think, I yeah. think this is especially a great discussion to have. The reason we are doing this episode is to you know give people a guide to g- how to get 120 Slayer before Metavoss comes out, which as you all know, if you do a little bit of math in your head, that's only about three months away at this point. I would guess that it's going to come out the last week in June, because I think they have said that June is going to be the release date. I wouldn't expect it early in the month. So you've got about three months to get there. So I think this is when something like an efficiency calculation comes into major importance you know as someone who a lot of times doesn't play this game min maxing this is one of those cases where i'm going to be because my hope like i said is to hopefully make money off of when metaphors first comes out maybe there'll be some super high drop rate on something you know we had that with aod for the first hour so who the heck knows what will happen with the new slayer monsters so you know that is something to keep in mind i mean it's also it's i think it's important to mention too that some people don't enjoy playing this way, which I think this guide will still be helpful for you because you will find out later that we're going to cover basically every monster that is worth doing 99 plus, whether it's an AFK method, whether it's a high high money making method, or whether it's the best XP in the game method. So no matter what style you play, there's there's still going to be something here for you in the podcast as to how to get 120 Slayer. You just, you just probably won't get it when Menafoss is out, unless you have more time to play, then, then you probably could. But, you know, I think at this point it's like 1.5 mil XP a day that you would need something like that to get it by June. I didn't do up-to-date calculations, but it's it's somewhere around there as we're recording. Anyways, um, also we want to talk about uh, making money. and Well, actually, I guess we basically covered that part of it, so I don't need to, and, to reference And I that. wanted to add to that real quickly. In the past, when new Slayer mobs have come out, Eretz comes to mind as the <coughs> primary example. They'll release um, early bird bonuses. So if you kill the mobs within the first week or two of release, you get better drop rates for whatever it is their, their best loots are. I obviously have no clue whether that'll happen this time. But it's not uncommon that those early bird bonuses happen. Or most recently, Nightmare Muzpa, for the first few weeks after release, had an equal drop rate for the gauntlets, whether on or off task. And that was most recently changed, where gauntlets are much more rare off task. So for people who had the Slayer level already, were able to farm them, could have made a lot more money uh, doing those off task if they already had the level going in. So, So again, I'm not sure whether... Either of those examples, either purposeful boosts or non-purposeful boosts will happen, but there, there's a chance that they might. I mean, and I feel, we, yeah, of course we can't, there's no way to guarantee this, of course, Jagas would like a perfect release, but I also think, you know, when you're releasing something like 120, I would imagine we're going to get, I would hope, at least like 10 new creatures, and with that many coming into the game, I would imagine that there's going to be some of them that are that are differently balanced, and there might even be more, because they may release, they may fill up like, you know, the 80s and 90s spaces with better creatures, who knows how exactly they'll handle the 120 Slayer release, but yeah, we can we can make no guarantees there, but Judging from the past, this stuff is kind of bound to happen on on some level. And I mean, I'm also hoping that maybe it'll just be a new rare item. Like I will, I don't know what kind of weapon they could put there, but I, I I remember the days of old when you know abyssal demons were awesome to kill for the abyssal whip and not just for you know training invention. Right now, I mean, you can also make decent money there still, but the whip is basically useless. I would love if they could figure out a way to bring that kind of monster back to Slayer, but who knows if they will. Anyways, we will move on to our next section. We're get, what we're going to be covering here is ways to boop, boop. What we're going to be covering here is ways to boost your DPS and items that will increase your efficiency. So I'll go ahead and hand this over to you, David, and you can run through these. Sure. So the first one is the Slayer helmet. Um, of course, it requires the Smoking Kills quest to train up your slayer points to eventually acquire it it requires a black mask in addition to other items once you hit the appropriate slayer levels you could upgrade the slayer helmet in order for it to boost both ranged and magic as well and it's just a flat dps increase the ability to unlock better tiers of the slayer helmet uh, allows it to become better and better as you get more slayer points and eventually at the highest level you should be using a mighty slayer helmet for all of your tasks uh, because there's there's really no no 
conceivable downside to doing so. It's just the best flat boost to uh, best flat boost to DPS available. And, and this is the reason. Yeah. And Harley, what were you going to say? I said, this is the item which I famously did not get at all until after I already had 99 Slayer because I didn't feel like <laughs> doing any quests. I didn't quests. even realize that. <laughs> yeah, well, the quests are worth doing. And uh, you might oh, as yeah, well, I've done if you're going to be going for 120 Slayer, you might as well take advantage of the tremendous number of points that you're going to be receiving because they have all kinds of utility, especially with some of the recent changes to death store and the ability to buy things like aura refreshers that the points will always be useful um okay so the the next one here is the corruption abilities uh both corruption shot and corruption blast i would rarely recommend the use of ranged in slayer unless you're using mechanized chin champas which uh, i could talk well we'll talk about later but both would be highly recommended. Each the cost of each codex is about thirteen mil. They're the Maz Capability codexes, and they're extremely worth it. They not only provide a fantastic basic ability to put towards the front of your rotation, but also allow you to tag lots of creatures at once, which allows for a significant increase in efficiency and also lets you AFK many tasks, which allow you to group large amounts of creatures at once and and crush them with aoes yeah if you haven't used these abilities yet you should definitely if you don't think they're worth buying just look up a youtube video of how these things work because they completely change kind of how you play the game or you've probably been around somebody like if you've ever been in god wars and you've just seen somebody shoot one arrow and then it hits 15 monsters around it that's what these abilities are so i know some people might not know about them but look into them and definitely grab them they will definitely help now a question i have for you related to this these abilities uh you know i think that we haven't we won't get to this a little bit later but the max xp and hour methods are basically melee scape right so are these abilities like needed if you're going for just min max best xp and hour rates in slayer uh yeah absolutely because in most cases uh it, in many cases you aren't able to melee tasks uh, and we'll talk about those some when we talk about specific tasks. Secondly, um, for many methods, there's a if you want to choose to get very good XP but do AFK, magic is much better than melee. So, for example, in Abyssal Demons, melee is much better XP, but magic is also very good XP. And because of this specific ability, it allows you to basically almost entirely AFK Abyssal Demons and still get very competitive rates. And lastly... Um, in many cases, Chinchampas outclass even melee in terms of best XP, and having corruption shot in your rotation with Chinchampas is extremely good. Ah, that makes that makes sense. Um, now, as far as magic goes, since we're talking about abilities, what ability do you use when you are doing Slayer? Like, are you using Blood Barrage, or what spell book are you on in one ability? Or, I guess, it might be depending on the weakness of the monster, but is there, I don't know, like, the Blood Barrage does that thing that self-heals you, and I think is also an AoE in and of itself, so is that something that is useful in Slayer? So, if I, if, G, if money was not a concern, I would be using Blood Barrage for most instances. The only thing is that the, the way Blood Barrage works is that it, it certainly heals you, but in most cases, Soul Split is more than enough to heal you back uh, in, in almost any task where you would be using AoE Mage damage. The only places where I would use Blood Spells, really, or Ancient Books at all, is against Muzpa, because they, Blood Spells are, and actually Ancient Spells in general, do double damage against Muzpa. In general, I'm just using the normal spell book, and I use Air Runes, uh, the most powerful air spell. Uh, air, uh, air. What is it? Air blast. <laughs> I don't even know. Yeah, what it's I'm called. not sure. That sounds air, about right not air you. wave. Uh, not air surge. Sorry, it's air surge is the most powerful air spell. So I just use that because it's the cheapest. All right, cool. Anyways, we can move on to the next one. You have them. Okay. Um. So the next one, and this one is the single best item that you could get from a quest, in my opinion, because of how diversely useful it is. Uh, it's useful in high-level PBM in any situation, and that is Berserk Blood Essence. 
Uh, the days of Overload being the best DPS boost from a potion in game are long gone following the release of River of Blood. It surprises me how few people still use Essence. Perhaps it's kind of a laziness thing. Perhaps they don't want to do the quest, or maybe they just don't know about it. But if you use Supreme Potions, so Supreme Magic Range, Defense, Attack, Strength, they... It, they will work with Blood Essence. Blood Essence does not work with Overload because if you try to use Essence, it will say a more powerful effect is active. So essentially, you use whatever your single stat boost potion is, and then you use Blood Essence in your pocket slot. Blood Essence works in two ways. The first is a passive, which procs based on how often you're being hit. Clearly in Slayer, this is extremely good because you're being hit by so many targets at once in most places, think Dark Beast, Abyssal Demons, Adamu, etc., that it'll almost constantly be activated. It provides a flat boost of something like 15 levels to whatever your level is. So that means that with a Supreme Magic Potion, instead of boosting your level to 118, which is what an Overload would do, it boosts your level to 131, assuming 99 Magic. The increase in both accuracy which isn't as relevant in slayer but and but magic damage is massive in comparison to overloads once in a while uh at the very least every time you use an ultimate uh so sunshine death swiftness berserk etc you want to manually activate your blood essence this requires congealed blood to charge it which is extremely cheap uh, especially when compared to overloads, and even more so when compared to scrimshaws. It's a small fraction of the price. It will boost your damage for approximately 21 to 23 seconds, depending on whether or not you got a proc when boosting. So the way it works is that every time the Blood Essence activates, your stats timer gets reset to its previous level. So if you pay even a moderate amount of attention, for the entirety of your Slayer task, you can keep your Magic stat or Attack stat or Strength stat or whichever one at its maximum boost of level 131 for the entirety of these tasks with only one or maybe two sips of Potion. So this not only improves your DPS by a tremendous amount, but also saves you the cost of Overloads and saves you the cost of Scrimshaws. And uh, really, there's no downside to it whatsoever, except for tasks where you might need to use Ceridome and Bruise, because if you use Ceridome and Bruise to heal yourself, that, of course, wrecks your stats, and you don't have overloads to get you back up. Yeah, this is, I think, definitely one of those things that it just kind of fell through the cracks that most people didn't realize was as good as it was. Because I remember when the quest came out and people were like, oh, this is, it's a shame that Blood Essence doesn't have, you know, a very much of a use in the game. And I remember a few months ago when you first told me about this, my mind was kind of blown at the, the amount of boost this is. I mean, I think it's important, in case you misheard earlier, that wasn't 15%. As we all know, over, I think overloads are 15%, and then like supreme overloads are six, 16%. That's 15 levels, which is a huge difference over um, what you know a 15% increase would be. Um, and yeah, I, I just think people haven't realized it. I mean, especially because you've said of how cheap it is. I feel like people must not yet have realized how good this is. I think the more people, the more it catches on, there's a chance that this will shoot up in price at some point, in my opinion, if it catches on. A lot. I guess it is a little bit more complicated to use, so that could be another reason. But I think it's just it's people. You know, it's hard to teach a old dog new tricks, I suppose. And people probably have thousands of overloads made and are just so used to using them. But yeah, if you want a min max, check this out. I my recce quest series is high on my list of quests to do ASAP for rewards like this. Yeah, Blood Essence costs something like twenty k an hour to use at Slayer, uh, and that's what one one kill of a dark beast so it, it's almost it, it's almost nothing uh in terms of cost and just make sure to use it with those single stat boosting potions so yeah. extremes are okay it's worth spending the time to make supreme potions it requires you to purchase the unlock from the miller mylier you know it's m-e-i-l-y-r i don't know the correct pronunciation uh, but you go to their clan leader, purchase the potion. It does not require you to find any of these potions in Demonheim. Uh, you simply pay GP, unlock the potions, 
make 500 of each supreme pot uh they're way cheaper than overloads you know like something like a sixth or even a tenth of the cost of an overload and you use that and you use essence and because of the way essence procs uh oftentimes you only use one to two doses per task whereas with overloads you have to replenish your stat your your boost every six minutes so you have to bring more overloads where in fewer of the supreme potion so once you get used to it it's actually much easier and much more beneficial to just use essence and uh, i use it nearly everywhere awesome all right we can go ahead and move on to the next thing you have on the list here um so the next thing we have is just simply overload so they're, they're they sound like supreme are better than uh, others, but I would recommend Holy Overloads. Uh, it'll, it's a combination potion that combines prayer renewals, which provide a slow uh, regenerate over time boost to prayer. The real reason to use them is, of course, they turn four dose overloads into six dose overloads, which, of course, will save you a lot of money uh, because 10k GP, which is about the price of a prayer renewal, is much less expensive than two fourths of an overload um and so yeah i would use holy overloads for almost any slayer task the exception would be at queen black dragon or king black dragon or rune dragon searing overloads are often preferable because they combine super anti-fires with overloads but again not really necessary just slightly more convenient uh yeah and I don't, I don't know if you have thoughts on overloads, Harley, but nope. I mean, that's pretty I, self-explanatory. Yeah, I think everybody knows what they're like these days. I mean, I, I mostly use holy overloads when I, when I'm doing something like Queen Black Dragon, I use Supreme Overload and I think Bright Fire Potion, if I remember correctly. Sure. Which yeah, is, and that's that's a good combination also. Yeah. Which is which gives you the holy overload. Well, the, the Bright Fire Potion is a prayer renewal and a super anti fire and probably something else I'm forgetting. So yeah, it's also a way to to no, solve it's, that. It's it's just those two. Okay, I couldn't remember. It's just those two. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. And uh, next here we have uh, the Salve Amulet. So what did you have to say about that? So Salve Amulet, it comes from the Haunted Mine. I would highly recommend doing the Tarn's Razor mini quest because it gives you an ability to make Salve Amulet enchanted uh, against undead. Uh, most specifically, Edamu would be the main use for Salve Amulet ease. It just provides a flat 20% boost to damage and accuracy which is obviously tremendous it stacks with slayer helmet in addition to any other perks that you might be using to increase damage to the undead uh, so it's a fairly massive uh boost to dps and it's very niche only works for the undead and really the only really good undead task like i said is enemy but you know this could change uh, of course metaphos is the city of the city of the dead is that is that uh Am I remembering that correctly? I know that there. Yeah, are the, I think the, that's right. Right, and so, so I think that maybe there's a chance that there are lots of undead Slayer creatures, and that will be released with Manaphos, where this amulet will be even more useful than it already is. Yeah, awesome. I will have to get that. I, I know very little about the Salve amulet. It's one of those things that came out in the time while I was gone, and I haven't fetched it yet. But th this, you know, this podcast is going to be as much a list for things I need to figure out if, if as much as the listener out there has to figure out. Yeah, it's a it's a treacherously tedious quest, but as long as you use a guide and follow it correctly, it, it's not too bad. And um, yeah, just get the quest done. And I'd recommend making a bunch of them because you don't want to have to go back and redo mine in well, case you lose your salve amulet. Let's not forget that, I mean, I completed Morning's End Part 2 live streaming without getting angry. I won 15 mil for that, so I think I can handle, well, I can handle Haunted Mind is in, Haunted Mind is not as bad as that, that's for sure. Okay, well then, that's going to be a cakewalk. Yeah, easy for you. Um, great, okay. So the next thing here is the cannons, uh, old act coils, etc. There's also a me melee and range versions of old act coils, but they're rarely used. Uh, actually, I think it's just a melee version. But anyways, cannon does range damage. Old act coil does mage damage. The advantage to the cannon is that it has much longer range. So, for example, 
if I were going to Dark Beasts, I and I were using the uh, using the spawn of Dark Beasts most close to the teleport location, I would use a regular Dwarf Multi Cannon because it aggro's Dark Beasts from really far away. Whereas if I was in the other room where it's much smaller and the creatures are more packed, I might bring an Oldak Coil. Basically, they're a relatively large increase to DPS, although much less so compared to the old days. Cannons are no longer like a requirement, but they do uh, aggro creatures for you in a way that's very effective. Aggression potions have obviously made cannons seem somewhat obsolete, but really they're, they're still not. They still increase your overall DPS, and as I said previously, the cannons will aggro creatures that are outside of the range of your aggression potions, and they also allow you to be much more AFK when doing methods like Dark Beasts. Uh, the other advantage of the old deck coil is, I'm sure many of you have the familiar struggle of not being able to put your cannon away because it requires four inventory spaces. The old deck coil only requires one inventory space, uh, which makes it a little bit more convenient. Uh, there's also It also appears to do slightly more damage, but I don't think that it's quite enough to be you know, a really significant difference to the cannon. If you are going to use a cannon at Slayer, don't do what I did. Do Artisan's Workshop right away. Get yourself the Royal Cannon that, uh, or the Golden Royal Cannon, which refuels itself. Uh, it makes things much easier and more effective. The last reason to use a cannon is that if you have a cannon down at a place like Dark Beasts, I, in my experience, you are far less likely to get crashed. Um, yeah, that's what I was so. going to say. Yeah, I, I will sometimes bring a cannon. I won't necessarily use it all the time. Like when I was camping in the Abyss just to finish off my 99 combat stats on double XP weekend, I literally just had a cannon there for defense. So somebody would show up and I would just drop my cannon and then they would probably leave in like five to 10 minutes because it basically hurt their DPS quite a bit. And so, yeah, that that's a a great thing to do just to keep people from crashing you. I mean, I would also like to say with this topic, you know, cannons are a bit controversial because a lot of people who use cannons are assholes out there. So uh, as Will Wheaton would say, don't be a dick. Like, you know, find, find your own world. You can spend a little bit of time hopping and find a place to set up that isn't packed. You don't have to, you don't have to crash somebody to, to use your cannon. Absolutely. And uh, because of the way I do Slayer, and even though it's not, white as big of a boost as it used to be with the advent of aggression potions it's still worth it in my opinion and any task where i am able to use a cannon i certainly do so all right so next one is aggression potions uh this is self-explanatory any place where there are large numbers of creatures which you can group up and kill with aoes can be done much, much, much more efficiently with aggression potions. Uh, most famously, due to a uh, you know, YouTuber, Abyssal Demons have become the the biggest place where people have used aggression potions. It's almost impossible to find an Abyssal Demons world. And in fact, it's so difficult that there's an argument to me that Abyssal Demons aren't even worth doing because of how much time is lost hopping worlds. But we we'll talk about that later. But essentially, any place where you're going to be using AoEs, whether melee, ranged or magic you should be using aggression potions to group up creatures yeah aggression potions are just super fun to use too they really kind of just change combat quite a bit i mean it's like anywhere you go it basically feels like god wars one without protection items on except you know now that we have soul split and stuff it's not terrifying because you just put out a crap ton of dps but it is it is a it's just a fun way to train the skill in general even beyond just the fact that it's obviously fantastic dp yep and when you combine with magic at a place like abyssal demons uh it allows you to be essentially afk for the duration of the the aggression potion being active so you could go put on your aggression potion make your aoe uh rotation and go you know make a sandwich or or something or make some coffee you just you totally leave your computer so so for those who want to afk aggression potions are definitely worth it and i would definitely say these potions are also they're expensive but you know you can grow your own herbs and probably get pretty close to being self-sufficient if you wanted to on this one i believe these are made with blood weeds right so that's like wilderness only yep that's the wilderness herb yep yeah so if you you know wilderness runs not that terrible to make you just do the teleport to level 15 wilderness and just run straight past the uh 
spot right there for divination and you most of the time don't get pk'd uh what i do when i do that also is i bring a glory or some kind of ring that has a teleport on it and then i put that on my action bar and so then i only have to get 10 levels because you can teleport is it well i can't remember now if it's 30 or no yeah it's level 30 wilderness so you can teleport with something like a glory so you just have to get i think five levels away from the farming patch so you can be gone so it basically makes it impossible for PKers to kill you, which is also a great feeling when a PKer tries to attack you and you just free them and then teleport. It's, it's good fun. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Sounds uh, sounds pretty good. Um, alrighty. Um, let's see. So, next one I have here is Vecna Skull. This isn't as relevant to people in who would be listeners of the show necessarily, but if you're using Blood Essence and you don't want to make magic potions or you want to save money, the Vecna Skull boosts your magic by about 12% and it stacks with Berserk Blood Essence. And so if you want to camp somewhere for a really, really long time, like say you're doing Abyssal Demons and you're planning on getting 120 Slayer just by doing contracts uh, and just you know camping them forever, or if you just for some reason, don't want to make potions or buy potions, then Vecna Skull is a uh, functionally free uh, because it's a cheap item to buy and you could just resell it. Uh, boost to your magic DPS. Okay, so this is just a tradable item on the GE, or what? Yeah, you just buy, but you just buy it on the GE. It's like I don't know, 100k or something like that, and it's basically just a free magic potion. Wow, I've never I think, heard, I think heard of this before. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I think it's about as good as... You, I think it's slightly better than using super magic potions, but not as good as extremes, something like that. Um, I'm not sure who necessarily would be using this, but again, if you are camping a place for a really long time, or um, you just for some reason want to save that money, uh, then you could do that. Yeah, I mean, this would be, in my opinion, possibly a good way to make money, to, you know, to fund your Slayer. If you want an AFK way to make money to, to fund your more like, more expensive Slayer training methods, you could do something like take this to Abyssal Demons, and like you said, AFK there, have something like a Legendary Pet out that's picking up most of your drops, and you have a uh, Spring Cleaner that's breaking down the drops that are not being picked up, and that way you can, you can, pre- you can be super AFK if you do something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you still have to use it every few minutes. It's kind of it work. It, it, it works like potion. It works like any potion where your stats go down over time. But when used with Berserk Blood Essence, uh, I, th- I think that it might be pretty AFK. Just depends. Um, okay, so next thing I have is drop cleaners. So the first one is the Demon Horn Bone Crusher combination. So both of these, of course, are from. Uh, are purchasable rewards from Demonheim. I would highly recommend getting both of them because there's still many tasks where the combination of the two is phenomenal. The most obvious example is Dark Beast. Uh, you could pray magic and pray whatever style of prayer you're using. And with the combination of a Bone Crusher and Demon Horn la- Necklace, you have functionally infinite prayer points uh, because, of course, the way it works is that for every bone that you bury, uh, you gain prayer points back in exchange for it, uh, and the Bone Crusher buries all the bones for you. I would highly recommend getting the Bone Crusher on your tool belt so you don't have to worry about using an inventory space for it or forgetting it. I can't tell you how many times in the early days of learning Slayer where I lost tremendous amounts of time simply from forgetting things like Bone Crusher or my Charming Imp. Uh, and so, so, yeah, so the main... Uh, drop cleaners are herbicide. Uh, there are still many creatures, although fewer and fewer at higher levels because most of their herbs are noted, that drop uh, relatively worthless herbs. At the very least, they're, they're not worth picking up and, and taking to the bank. And so the herbicide will destroy them for you and give you a small amount of herbivores in exchange. Acetaside, which can be garnered from Cabbage Face Bunch Bonanza, is extremely worth doing. Uh, there are many tasks such as Aquanites or Dark Beasts that are actually very good farming XP per hour because all of the seeds that you get, except for maybe a few of the higher level ones, there are options to select which seeds get turned into farming XPs and which don't, uh, can actually make you quite a lot. A funny story is 
I had grapevine seeds on my seed aside because I had no idea what they were. I just assumed that they were like wishing well seeds and, and basically worthless in terms of GP but would give me a lot of farming XP. And for the first 800 or so Virago kills that I did, I had grapevine seeds on my seed aside. And so I probably lost tens of mils of GP from, uh, from all those Virago kills. But uh, I did get some farming XP, so there's <laughs> that as a consolation. But yeah, I would I would highly recommend before 120 slave getting this because you will get you know a significant amount of farming XP just by getting 120 slayer. Uh, I know that I've gained just from just from seed aside. I've gone from 99 to 105 farming, and maybe that doesn't seem like a lot, but 13 mil XP. Uh, and I'm actually 116 Slayer, uh, so I'm only two-thirds of the way there, and I've got 16 mil farming XP, which isn't nothing. Um, so, so yeah, I would definitely recommend that. The, the next one is Charming Imp. Uh, I destroy gold and green charms because I can't imagine myself ever using them. Uh, this is tremendously helpful because picking up charms is a, can often result in a loss of DPS or can result in you know, things getting messed up. And uh, yeah, so those are the, the kind of big four are Bone Crusher, Charming MC Beside, or Herbicide. I would recommend getting all four before pursuing 120 Slayer. I guess this one's not as worth mentioning right now because of how expensive um, Ghost Slayer oh, Essence God, is. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, a year ago, an actual useful item in the game was the Attuned Ectoplasmator, but. Ghostly Essence is ungodly expensive since in Veteran Game, yeah. thanks to in thanks to the Abyssal Demon meta that has popped up. Yeah, they actually it's actually interesting because I they actually increase the amount of GP per hour you make at Edemu because Edemu drop Ghostly Essence at a very high volume and quite frequently. Um, but and in other aspects, yeah, they're so it's so expensive that I don't even use it at Krill and Saroth anymore. I just use just bring a bunch of potions, uh, a bunch of yeah. restore potions. But I mean, yeah, I think the it, thing it, you can do is use the you know the non-attuned version if you if you just want the the prayer XP. Of course, it's not near as good as the attuned, but it's. Uh, I feel like yeah, with Ghostly as and Surprise, it is right now. It's not really worth doing, which I think Jagus has been talking about potentially upping where that's dropped from, which would be good. It's interesting too because like spiritual mages, which are how I made like thirty forty mil right after I got ninety nine Slayer. They were like three mil an hour back then, and now they're up to about like four mil an hour because Ghostly Essence went up and Soul Runes went up and all this stuff thanks to 120 Slayer just shot up in price. So, you know, there's a lot of yep. lower level Slayer monsters thanks to stuff Invention has done that are even more profitable now. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Soul Runes, I think, are, are a largely a result of the Saren spells being added to the game, but Ghostly Essence, I think, is, is certainly a product of the Abyssal Demons and Invention, and, and yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I just, agree. I think, I also think Spiritual Mages might drop Blood Runes, too, but yeah, Soul Runes went up because of Saren spells, but I also think, I think Saren spells became more popular because of Invention, right? Because people, people doing skill Vention. Yeah, that's certainly possible. Uh, I, I haven't done a ton of skill Vention, but that certainly makes sense to me. Uh, invention probably made it go up even more than it already was. And powerful components, too, because uh, soul runes give you can give you a pretty high chance of powerful components, and so uh, if they weren't so expensive, people would be disassembling soul runes for powerful. But, of course, because they're so expensive, they're not actually worth disassembling. But anyways, uh, I think that pretty much clears things up for drop cleaners. Uh, they're both good for XP and just straight up improve your efficiency because you don't have to worry about picking up drops. Uh, so yeah. Uh, next is Excalibur. This is from the Sears uh, Elite Tasks. Uh, many tasks uh, require little to no food, but the Enhanced Excalibur Special can be the difference between it being absolutely no food versus having to use some food. The amount of, a lot of tasks, uh, and again, I keep going back to Dark Beast, but that's just such a familiar place for so many people for, for so many years now. And of course, they drop sharks. Uh, if you pray magic, you take a very small amount of damage. Uh, usually, you could heal yourself back with soul split flicking, but if you just bring the enhanced Excalibur with you, it's almost always more than enough 
and you don't have to worry about fiddling around and picking up sharks, losing adrenaline, wasting time with eating, etc. Uh, so definitely worth going going for that. And you get a nice nice chunk of XP for for doing the elite tasks. And enhanced Excalibur is a, a must have in most PVM presets. Uh, it's just uh, no cost healing is quite nice. Yeah, this is one of those items that I've taken way too long to get and need to get. To yeah, and, and the Sears, the Sears tasks I would argue are the least tedious task set. Uh, if if that's an incentive for anyone to to go for it, if they haven't already, uh, not going to say they're fun. Just that they're the least the least tedious. Okay. Uh, next, I have dark light. So this is. For demons, uh, specifically Ripper demons is where this is most useful, but also Calgarian demons if you choose to melee them. Uh, it improves, it essentially gives you similar or even better DPS to a Drygore main hand, uh, and it requires no invention, so it doesn't drain your charge pack at all. There's no repair cost, and it's free. Uh, definitely only worth doing, however, if you've done the Dimension of Disaster quest and have unlocked uh, the upgrade to it, because the unupgraded version is much less useful than a main hand tier 85 or tier 90. Weapon. Yeah, and as you mentioned, this is something that's like supremely important at Ripper Demons. That one of the things uh, yeah. about Ripper Demons is that they're extremely annoying because of their special attack where they jump up into the sky and disappear and it's super hard to notice. And if you are min-maxing DPS at Rippers, you don't have to deal with that special attack. So something like Dark Light that makes that easier to do is something that I highly recommend getting when when you're going to be killing them. Because if you're going for 120 Slayer and you're going for best XP rate spoiler, you're going to want to kill a lot of Ripper Demons. Yep. Uh, arguably the best task in the game for XP rates. Uh, and there is a small difference between a Drygor main hand with Aftershock 3 on it. Uh, the Drygor is still very, very good and competitive. Uh, you don't need Dark Light to do these efficiently, but anything helps, and it's also free, which is the reason I use it, is that it's comparable, but one costs money to use one is free. Uh, okay, so next is Sunspear. Um, so the Sun Spear is useful for basically two separate reasons. The first reason it's useful is that if you decide to do vampire tasks, this would be for people with lower Slayer levels, for uh, people who play Iron Accounts, uh, because from what I understand, the vampire tasks are very, very good for Iron Accounts. Uh, the Sun Spear is just a massive DPS boost against vampire uh, lords, fire lords, fire ladies. Uh, that's for the Firewatch task. Uh, it also cremates corpses for you, so you get prayer XP, um, and you get additional items, and it also just makes their drop table better. Uh, if you're min-maxing Slayer, Firewatch should not be one of the tasks you do. In fact, I recommend them blocked. But for Iron Accounts, uh, for people who are lower Slayer level, or for people who are avoiding some of the more high efficiency but more effort tasks, you may want to do those, and Sunspear makes it at least palatably good. Uh, I'll say that. Uh, not horrible is, is, is what they would become. The second reason is that Planted Feet is one of the most useful perks in the game for improving efficiency. And Sunspear, because of the way it works, can be used as a melee ranged or magic weapon. If you are low on money, Though, if you put Planted Feet on your Sun Spear, you only need one Planted Feet Gizmo instead of two. And you can use your Sun Spear as your Planted Feet switch for both ranged and magic. Uh, it's not quite as good in certain niche things, for example, Phase 5 Telos, but that's not really the scope of this particular uh, podcast. So for 120 Slayer, we definitely recommend getting Sun Spear, even if you don't plan on doing Vampire, simply because it would allow you to use planted feet for both magic and range for half the cost. Um, yeah. The, so next I have Amulet of Zealots. Uh, this is a item that I see very few people using, um, mostly because you know everyone kind of considers turmoil and equivalent to be the best prayers to use. Amulet of Zealots is another Dungeoneer award. 
uh, has two advantages. The first is that against creatures that you have 100% accuracy or close to 100% accuracy at, uh, it is much, much better to use than any other necklace in the game. It provides a significant boost, 10% uh, to your damage if you're using single stat boosting prayers. So, for example, uh, if you look at your prayer book, you have term Torment, it increases your attack, magic, strength, and defense. But you also have the prayers uh, Leech Magic Strength and uh, Leech Magic Attack. Using both of those with an Amulet of Zealots will provide a massively larger damage boost than even Affliction, which is the Tier 99 prayer. Uh, its cost is that it drains your prayer at a more significant rate because it's a minus five prayer boost. You can counter this by simply bringing an extra restore or two. And uh, overall, it just significantly increases your damage. The second reason to use it is that with the luck potion coming into the game or the new luck update, onyxes have skyrocketed. They're almost three mil each. So using that Hydrix jewelry is much more expensive and i would avoid using an amulet of souls whenever possible just because it has such a massive uh it, it has such a massive addition to the amount of money you're spending for our repairing items amulet of zealots is undegradable uh so once you buy it with your dungeoneering tokens you'll never have to repair it so you'll be getting both much better dps and also avoid the cost of using onyxes Awesome. Now, um, since we were talking about it, I guess I'll kind of launch us into the next topic here. As far as the next AOD prayers go, if you're not going to be using something like Game of the Zealots, I mean, they're ridiculously expensive right now, but if you have the money, do you think they're worth getting for Slayer? Oh, yeah. Slayer? Oh, yeah. It, yeah, it's, it, it's a... It, it, I mean, so define worth the money because it's a in most Slayer creatures you have nearly 100% accuracy against or 100% accuracy against. So it's essentially can you afford a 650 mil prayer for plus 2% DPS? Uh, the, the weight I would calculate this is that because there are so many cheaper options that are a larger DPS boost. So for example, if you don't have tier 90 weapons, that's much better to focus on than the new prayers. If you don't have the best perks, most perks, things like Precise 5, Aftershock 3, the Demon Slayer perk against Demon Task, etc., all of these things are more significant boost to DPS than the prayers. But if you have the money, there's really no reason not to do it. It has a higher drain rate, uh, so you'll have to bring extra prayer potions. But if you have enough money to afford these prayers, uh, it shouldn't really concern you too much. I so, only have affliction. I only have affliction because I use magic almost exclusively in high level PVM. When I bought these prayer, the prayer for high level PVM, I you know really regret not buying them on their release. So it was kind of silly not to. But but yeah, I mean, if if you're of the mindset that anything helps and you have the resources, I would definitely, uh, definitely, definitely get these prayers. Uh, they're but, very good and they're extremely good at high level. And yeah, it sounds like, but Zealots is, is, you said, the superior choice over these two. So I guess if you're going for like best XP and, you know, trying to decide if it's worth your money, I guess that kind of eliminates Oh, oh that wait. Bit, okay. So. I think I misunderstood your question, actually. You're asking Zealots versus the Tier 90 No, no. Yeah, so. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm changing it, the topic now slightly to say, but Zealots is still overall better than, than the next Zealots prayers. is, yes. Zealots is still much better than the Tier 99 prayers at places where you have 100% accuracy. So so actually, actually, I might have answered that question a little bit incorrectly, uh, actually. Uh, um, yeah, I think I kind of kind of messed up that question, Harley. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I would say no. Definitely, Tier 99 prayers, they're really good for specific Slayer tasks where you need accuracy for them uh, so calgarian demons would be an example for the vast majority of slayer tasks including most of the best xp methods uh i would use zealots um and not use the tier 99 prayers but if you want to min max to the extreme there are still certain tasks that are very good and worth doing where your accuracy is not super good against and so the tier 99 prayers would be good for those uh, but I would put that at the very, very bottom in terms of priority level. 
Gotcha. All right. That makes sense. The next yeah. thing we have on here is just something that I realized that we didn't have on here, so I kind of threw it on here. And that is uh, the Ring of Vigor. Um, this is something that we've talked about a bit before, and I'm not, you know, it depends. I guess it depends what Slayer monster you're fighting, whether or not you're AFK or not. But this is a ring that, when you use an ultimate ability, it saves 10% of your adrenaline. So you start at 10% yep. instead of zero, which is a pretty huge boost. It uh, is arguably, as you have said before, the best in slot ring in the game. If you're not doing a ring switch, just wear the ring of figure. And I think that would still apply to most of Slayer, wouldn't you say? Yeah, um, I, I mean, obviously ring switching will always be slightly better. Uh, and, but uh, if you're just going to be using one ring, uh, I would definitely use Ring of Vigor. Uh, it also yeah, I mean, yeah, if you're... It totally, totally facilitates AFK because if you're AFKing, most likely you'll be using magic for most of the, rec- the things I would recommend is, is magic is, is more or less the best AFK style. Uh, you could just alt tab every one minute when your sunshine comes back off cooldown and, and use your ultimate ability. And if you just have Ring of Vigor on the entire time, you don't have to worry about um, you don't have to worry about switching rings. There is a tiny DPS increase to using something like Asylum Surgeons. But yeah, and I was really, going to say it, Asylum it's not Surgeons. Not as good as the ten percent. It it will if you're going to do a ring switch, right? You want to use Asylum Surgeons because that will give you yes. that will give you a, a chance to save even more adrenaline, and the more adrenaline you can save, the better. Which is also to lead into something else that I didn't have listed in here, but I think we should mention, and that is replenishment potions or just straight up adrenaline potions. Oh yeah, absolutely. If you're if you're min maxing Slayer, make sure you have those so that you can drink those every two minutes when you alt and you know get your adrenaline that's i think that's 30 percent adrenaline that gives you so if you're using a ring of vigor and you drink that you're at 40 percent adrenaline already and you can get way more uh, way more threshold abilities off in that time uh this is particularly important when using melee uh because getting it to your aoe ultimates as fast as possible is really important it, it's 25 percent, by the way harley for the adrenaline potion uh, there's an upgrade that you could buy to the adrenaline potion to make it 30%, but those are so unbelievably expensive that there's there's just no scenario where I think that that's worth it. Oh, uh, what's that upgrade called? Um, there are these the adrenaline crystals, might be they're called. They're a death match reward. Um, it, oh, okay, it's, it, gotcha. Yeah, they, it, and you have to make them yourself. Uh, Make the a boosted adrenaline potions yourself, and they're just they're really expensive to use. Uh, maybe would be useful for going something like a record kill time at a boss, but it's such a tiny boost for such a high cost that I would not recommend it for Slayer, even when min maxing to the extreme. Uh, because I even think that the time spent making those potions is not mm-hmm. even worth the DPS increase if you're going to calculate just in yeah, terms of pure that's efficiency. Fair. And the nice thing about replenishment potions too, which I don't know if you can make those with that version, but replenishments will also, you know, restore your prayer, which means slightly less super restores, every, you know, every two minutes restore boost. Yep. So that's super nice. Yep, uh, definitely, definitely well worth using. Um, I any time that I'm really paying attention to Slayer, especially if I'm using AI, I always bring them up. So the next thing here is. Uh, is familiars so a lot of people aren't sure what familiars to use at slayer so basically the two dps familiars are titans uh preferably steel titan uh but use an iron titan if that's the best you can afford uh and nihils so titans anywhere you have 100 percent accuracy titans far outclass nihils you simply use all of your scrolls on your Titan and set the auto cast to every one tick, which functionally means anytime the Titan has enough summoning points to use its special, it'll use it. Uh, in certain For certain tasks, I min-max to the extent where I even bring summoning potions so I could just spam Titan specs constantly, although that's certainly never a requirement. Uh, and it's just functionally, you no, know, just a flat increase to DPS that requires either zero effort if you're just setting it to auto cast or some effort if you're using summoning potions for relatively small cost even at places where you don't have 100 percent accuracy titans are still worth using if you aren't willing to spend the price for a nihil nihils uh boost your uh accuracy by five percent it's a flat boost 
uh, which is, means it's the best possible boost you can get. Uh, stackable boosts are not quite as good as flat boosts. But essentially, after all of your accuracy is calculated, nigh hills and relevant styles, ice and smoke for magic, melee for, or sorry, blood for melee, and smoke for ranged, boost the corresponding accuracy by 5% at a task where you do not have 100% accuracy. For example, Calgarian Demons, it, I would highly recommend using a Night Hell uh, because it will significantly increase the amount of kills you get per hour. 5% boost to accuracy, especially uh, to larger, when, when uh, mobs have higher HP, which is likely if you do not have 100% accuracy against them, uh, is a tremendous boost. And while they do seem to cost a lot initially, the, the cost isn't as bad as you think relative to other DPS boosts. If you think about how much money you spend on overloads, for example, Nihils don't seem like a lot by comparison. Uh, yeah, so those are the kind of the two big DPS familiars. The, <laughs> the next is the healing familiars. So the best one by far following a new update is the unicorn. Previously, every time you use the unicorn special, it would drain your adrenaline, which is really bad. Now it doesn't drain adrenaline at all, so you can use as many unicorn special attacks as you have summoning potions. This allows for lossless HP by winning by lossless. It doesn't have the side effect of costing adrenaline, which food does, and it doesn't have the side effect of lowering your stats like Ceridomin brews. And so essentially it just allows you to keep DPSing while healing yourself. The other one is the bunyip. Uh, bunyips are really not useful too much, but if you are feeling like you could use just a little bit of extra healing, uh, so for example, maybe you're doing a Water Fiend's tasks and they're hitting you relatively high and you find yourself having to eat, sometimes the bunyip can be the difference between having to eat a shark every once in a while and not having to eat at all, uh, which of course is a slight increase to your DPS because you aren't losing adrenaline or time from those sharks. Another example is maybe something like Dark Beasts. The disadvantage to all of these familiars is that none of them can be used with a legendary pet. So for those who are focusing almost entirely on AFK, you won't be able to use the legendary pet to pick up drops. I think this has become a lot less relevant with area of effect looting. You could essentially just kill stuff for two minutes and just loot every couple of minutes with the area of effect loot on. And so I think that's much less big of a deal than it used to be. Yeah, I almost think that's also something worth basically listening to this is AOE looting. Um, there are a lot of people who have been playing the game for a long time who have not converted over to that way of thinking. I know Mage Pit specifically is one of those people who I believe still has AOE looting off. I think from what I understand when it first came out, it was super buggy. Uh, nowadays... There is really no problems with it. I have been using it for years at this point. I believe it's been out for a super long time, and I could I could never go back to the old way of looting. You know, you don't. People always complain you have to pick up everything. But the thing I do is I open up the window and I just click what I want. You know, you can sure you can hit loot all, and then that would make you pick up everything. But you can also just have that window open and just pick what you want. And if you're like meleeing something with aggro pots, you can literally click on the ground once, and your AOE win or your loot window will stay up constantly now it will disable auto attack unfortunately which i kind of hate and wish they would change because it used to be you could afk with your area loot window open and they basically made that slightly harder with the fact that auto attacks no longer happen but if you are min maxing slayer and not using not rely on auto attack to make sure you're attacking things you can you know basically just have your loot window up all the time and be popping stuff out of there without having to take a break at all from dpsing yep uh it's totally Totally worth using. Um, I, I think it's yeah. I think it's excellent. And the, so the w one way to counter the the problem of picking up too many drops is many bosses or many slayer tasks have extremely predictable drop tables. So dark beasts will always give you noted adamant or noted you know certain noted herbs, etc. So what I do is I just bring one noted item of each one of the things that I know I want to pick up from that task, and then I fill the rest of my inventory space. So Dark Beast is also a good example because a lot of times you get constant death talismans, which are obviously not good to pick up and take up inventory space. What I do is I just bring uh, one noted version of all the noted items that I want to pick up, 
and uh, and then I'm able to to use the loot all and just spam the loot all button, and I don't have to worry about searching through my window for individual things that I want because the things that I want are already in my inventory. That's a, something I never really thought of before. Yeah, that's a good that's a good tip. Yeah, it it, it helps a lot. Uh, and and also on the subject of looting, uh, one drop cleaner that I forgot to mention was gold accumulators. Uh, I think for those of you who have gone for 120 Dungeoneering already, you'll have so many Dungeoneering tokens that you really don't know what to spend them on. Uh, one of the best ways to use them up is to buy gold accumulators uh, because they'll pick up all of your GP for you and you won't have to worry about it. And for tasks like Dark Beasts or Eretz or Abyssal Demons, a lot of their money comes just from the cold cash they drop on the ground and not having to concern yourself with that is pretty nice. Uh, okay. Uh, so, yeah, the next thing here, I kind of added this in late again, but uh, I realized we weren't didn't have it on the list, and that is the scythe. I, I guess we'll kind of talk about this a little bit in general, but I feel like this is kind of worth having its own bullet point about is the fact that if you uh, can afford a scythe and don't have one, and you want to go for one twenty slayer, uh, get one now. Yeah, uh, if you can. Yeah. Also, if you're if you're too broke for a scythe, there is a dragon rider lance, which is which is really slightly good. Slightly less, yeah. It's ever so it's slightly really less good. Yeah, it, yeah. So 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 I don't. Sorry, Harley. I didn't mean to like cut you off from your thing here. But I recently got cleaned at the arena and don't have a scythe. I've been using a dragon rider lance, and while obviously the scythe is superior in every conceivable way, the dragon rider lance is still so good that it's better than any. Uh, tier 90 weapon, excluding using mechanized chinchampas uh, for overall Slayer DPS if you're min-maxing. So if you're choosing, if you can only afford one good weapon for Slayer for some reason, uh, I would choose a Dragon Rider Lance over any tier 90 besides the Scythe uh, if I were doing Slayer. And if I can only afford one Noxious weapon, I would choose Noxious Staff and Dragon Rider Lance and have both of them uh, rather than than just a scythe. Uh, so I, I did want to add that to it. I, I think really what you need to do if you can't afford a noxious weapons is get good and just make your own. I mean, I'm definitely not boosting <laughs> yeah, myself yeah, up there or anything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, making your own is, is a pretty good method too. Uh, I would definitely, the rack store is pretty good. Yeah, and I think uh, just just to explain this for people who don't know, it's it's the AOE abilities on the scythe that make it so great. Well, that mixed with berserk, like the fact yep. the berserk and the AOE abilities on the scythe make you do so much damage that if you're doing like we said earlier, using the ring of vigor, and you've also got your replenishment potions in there, and you're doing a perfect rotation with the scythe. You're just gonna mow down enemies. This is what uh, why air roots used to be best XP in the game when they spawned melee only on Mazcab, is because you just took a scythe to them and sliced their faces off. Yep. Um, yep. Absolutely. Um, they're yeah, they're they're phenomenal. Uh, and particularly the reason why melee AOEs are so good is that they're thresholds. So a lot of the magic AoEs are all basic abilities, which is why it's easy to AFK with them. But because the melee AoEs are thresholds, they do much more damage than any other style's AoE abilities because no other style has AoE thresholds like melee does. And this reminds me of something else I wanted to say too. If you are want to do like mostly AFK Slayer, uh, something great to turn on, which most most high level PVMs have off most of the time. Maybe you still have it on in general, but is ability queuing because it will allow you to you know you can basically just set up so that as soon as Hurricane is off of being recharged, it'll be cast. And you don't have to. Be, it basically just gives you like a fifteen second break where you don't have to look at your screen. You know, have Revolution on, have an ability queued up after you just cast it, and it'll be cast again as soon as it's able to be and i use that quite a bit when i'm doing something like abyssal demons or i'm just in the abyss fighting the monsters down there too that way i don't have to pay as close attention as i would if i was you know doing something like rax yeah that's a that's a really good idea uh definitely ability queuing for slayer is really good uh, it can get you killed at certain high level pvm situations but for something like slayer i, I think harley is absolutely right that it is well worth using uh, for things like have, using Hurricane immediately. Definitely. 
Um, and yeah, I totally agree that Scythe, Scythe is a category of its own in terms of a DPS boost. I would much rather uh, focus on spending money on a Scythe than, say, unlocking a new prayer. Awesome. Um, All right, we can move on to our last topic in this category, which is invention perks. I'm sure this is going to be a long one, though, so I will hand this over to you. Yeah, so invention perks are, are so lengthy that it can be a category of its own. Uh, we're actually going to be doing specific shows just on perks, so I'm not going to go into extreme detail in this particular segment, but instead I'm just going to kind of list the perks that I think are useful to acquire, and then uh, I think that we'll have other shows that focus on how to get those perks, which combinations to use, best combinations, different uh, different things that can be done, uh, and min-maxing with invention uh, will be the focus of other topics. but. For, for this show, uh, basically, there are a few different categories of perks. There's flat offensive boosts, uh, there's defensive perks, and there's specific, uh, specific single DPS boosting perks. So the offensive perks that are worth using, the best one is Precise 4 Equilibrium 2. Uh, it is currently slightly bugged, and that Equilibrium 2 will not allow your critical hits to proc for certain ultimates such as onslaught you won't be using onslaught at all in slayer so this is the overall best in slot dps perk it is a what you would put on your weapon gizmo uh, i have only one of them on my staff with Sliske. it took a little over a thousand attempts with five precise components to get and so i would not really recommend doing this unless you have really everything else possible it's about a 1% bonus over the next best, which is Precise 5. Uh, this can be gotten just from five arm build components. It's relatively easy to get. Uh, relatively cheap for how, how excellent it is. Uh, it boosts your DPS by something like 7%. The next one, the next two are Aftershock 3, which can be garnered from Ilijankin components. Uh, they're, it's expensive, but well worth it. If you can't afford it, Equilibrium 3 is a much cheaper alternative that can be garnered from rumbling components. So really, in your weapon gizmo, it should be really just those three things uh, uh, in any combination. The Precise 4 Equilibrium 2 Aftershock 3 is the best, but Precise 5 Equilibrium 3 is also quite good. The next is uh, perks that you would put on your armor. So the two main ones, the, the three primary ones are Impatient, Biting, and Crackling. Uh, I would recommend all three of these. Biting 2 and Crackling 3, and especially Crackling 2, can are very easy to combine with other perks, so you could maximize the number of perks per piece of armor. Uh, since you only have four available armor slots, I would definitely recommend going for some of these combinations, even if they are relatively hard to get. Uh, the Impatient uh, essentially makes it so you have a chance to gain more adrenaline from abilities. Um, or from auto attacks, which is of course really useful, especially when you're using thresholds. If you're not planning on using any thresholds, uh, or you're planning on AFKing mostly, it becomes less relevant because you won't be using your threshold abilities too often. So, for example, you might have different sets of armor. So on my melee Slayer armor, I always use Impatient 3, but on my magic gear, I don't have Impatient 3 because I'm often AFK when I'm using magic at Slayer anyway, so it's actually not super useful. The <coughs> next one, uh, and then the next set are, are the, the DPS boosters. So you have Genocidal, which is useful for any Slayer setup because as your task continues, it increases the amount of damage you deal up to 7%. Uh, I would argue it's the single best overall perk for Slayer, aside from the weapon gizmo perks that I talked about earlier, it's very easy to combine with other perks. So it can be combined with Biting, it can be combined with Undead Slayer, it can be combined with Demon Slayer, it can be combined with Crackling, it can be combined with, uh, I think, a couple of other, oh, d uh, Devotion, and uh, as well as others. So it's quite easy to get uh, and very worth getting. The next are the three single boosters so demon slayer undead slayer and dragon slayer all of these with the exception of demon slayer are very 
You're easy to combine with either crackling, biting, or genocidal in order to save you slots. And the last set are defensive. Uh, the last set are defensive perks, uh, which include uh, devotion, enhanced devotion, lucky, absorptive. And I would, in general, not recommend any of these for Slayer as they uh, most oftentimes you don't need that additional defense when doing something like the Dark Beast. The last thing that I would look to are uh, things like efficient and scavenging. A lot of times these can be combined. They're extremely useful. The scavenging perk obviously allows you to harvest components and rare components every time you kill a creature. The efficient perk or the enhanced efficient perk makes it so your drain rate uh, is smaller. Uh, these can often be combined with each other or combined with other things. And I use both of them uh, because I think that while obviously the DPS boosters are a little better in terms of overall efficiency, I think that the way, the amount of money saved by the reduced drain rate in addition to all of the components that you get, especially from a task like Dark Beasts or Abyssal Demons, uh, where you're killing lots of them at once, uh, I think that they're they're actually quite worth doing. The last one is the Trophy Takers perk, which has a chance of extending the duration of your Slayer task. In my opinion, this is not worth uh, getting and is not worth the perk slot. So unless you're getting that as a combination with something else that you find useful, I would definitely recommend against uh, getting that perk just because while it might be kind of nice to have your task boosted by a bit in terms of its length, uh, it's it's really not worth using the perk slot. Um, yeah. Awesome. That was definitely, yeah. that's definitely a lot of uh, perk knowledge to take in. But yeah, look at Yeah, as and we'll said, be going over combination. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Harley, you can go. Yeah, as you said, we will be going over invention as a whole in at least one more podcast it may might be a series we haven't decided how that's going to happen yet but you know we'll try to cover in depth how to, how to get those perks slash what perks are good hopefully have a skill and aspect to that one as well so that is yeah yeah absolutely um okay and I, I realize there is actually one more thing potentially worth mentioning in here i don't know that this will be that long but uh auras Especially, yeah. um, you know, the dedicated Slayer aura is a good one for when you get a task that you really want to be able to extend. Yep. Uh, I, I, I find myself um, using auras for every single task. There's really no reason not to. In terms of DPS, the Zerk auras are best, so Maniacal, Reckless, Berserk, uh, followed by the Accuracy auras, but... Interestingly, in Slayer, because you so frequently have 100% accuracy or nearly 100% accuracy, the single stat boosting auras, which are in general the best for PVM, are actually not that great for Slayer. Instead, I would recommend Dark Magic as arguably the best overall aura for Slayer for all three styles. Because of the way it works, it procs based on how often you're getting hit, how often you're doing hits, how often you're targeting. So it actually provides quite a significant DPS boost, and it works with all three styles. The Majorat 5% aura is really excellent as well as a hybrid uh, useful aura. And the Equilibrium aura, now that it works with Biting, is also quite useful as a flat DPS boost. In places where accuracy does matter, so for example, Calgarian Demons, uh, I would use one of the single stat boosting auras, but it's very important to pay attention to what your accuracy is because if you have tier 90s and are using either overloads or supreme potions with blood zerker essence, most of the time those auras are actually useless because there's no difference between having 100% accuracy and 110% accuracy. Um, and yeah, as Harley said, dedicated slayer can be nice if you're planning on doing a lot of slayer for a long time, especially if you plan on canceling tasks until you get the ones that you really like. Uh, so we could talk about that later. But for some people, the way they would min-max it, the, the way that 
you would mid max flare in the past was literally to constantly cancel tasks until you got Eretz and just do Eretz and that was it. Uh, and so the dedicated Slayer aura was obviously really nice for that because it saved you just, it just straight up saved you Slayer points because you would have longer air tasks. Now also, I believe, weren't some of the, the, they did the crafting update and wasn't one of the rings or necklace something that would extend Slayer tasks too? Do you remember the details on that? Because I can't Oh, think. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. One, one of the silver jewelry items. I'm not yeah. sure what that was. At, at this level, I can't foresee it being as good as using the Amulet of Zealots or Amulet of Souls or, or something like that. Or if it's a ring, it keeps, there's no way it's as good as like a Ring of Vigor, for example, or Siam Surgeon's Ring. So the other thing is that they, it also had a duration, so you probably have to bring five or six of them. It seems cumbersome, difficult to use, and, and not worth it. So maybe if there's a task that you're really, really, really in love with for some reason, I guess maybe use it. Uh, or like maybe if you're farming the QBD pet, for example, and you only want to do it on task, then maybe you would bring it as a ring switch at QBD. I could see that potentially, but but I, I, overall, I can't really see much utility for those uh, for for that for the silver jewelry. I, I think that's more geared at lower level players. Yeah, uh, that... where where lower level Slayer, you know, before you get to Curadel, is chocked full of abysmally bad tasks. And so perhaps for those lower level slayers, uh, it might be useful to use that silver jewelry since you don't have access to the higher level items or can't afford the higher level items because so many of the tasks that someone like uh, Duradel assigns are just, or the Hilder or whoever is just so god awful. Yeah, all right, that is a good point. And uh... I think that does it for uh, this topic, unless you have something else that you wanted to add to that part. I, I think that, that that is mostly everything. I may think of things when we're going through specific uh, specific tasks, um, but in general, that's that's pretty much uh, good. And I think that we're talking about chins in a different section, so I don't think we need to cover them here. Yeah, I believe so. Actually, here's something I thought of that we possibly could cover. Uh, uh, 99 capes as, as far as which ones are best to oh use in that's slayer. interesting yeah 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 yeah. that's a really good idea actually so when using melee the strength cape is really excellent um it's not as good as using the using like say a tokar cape but if you have a max cape it's definitely good to use it increases the length of dismember uh just straight up you know small niche little dps boost uh, other good ones would be the attack cape reduces the degrade of your armor. The invention cape I think is really excellent uh, because it reduces the amount of charges that you use. The slayer cape teleports you to masters, which is pretty nice if you don't do Curadel uh, anymore. So once you've run out of ferocious rings to teleport yourself to Morvan, uh, it's pretty nice, I think, to put Slayer Cape in your Slayer preset or just bring it to you on task. So you could just immediately teleport straight back to Morvan and get your next assignment. Uh, and the Dungeoneering Cape is phenomenal in terms of its teleports. It teleports you all over the game. And a lot of tasks are in far off places, but there's a Dungeoneering uh, teleport right next to them, or even. Places like Calgarian Demons, you know, it might not seem like a big deal to use a Ring of Kinship versus using the Teleport. But, you know, every time you do a Calgarian Demons task, if you save 30 seconds, you know, that's still something that you're you're saving. And so I think a Dungeoneering Cape and Slayer Cape should be in everyone's presets. And then on my Max Cape, I have the Strength perk, the Invention perk, and the Defense perk for, for PVM purposes. Now you uh, said... The last one... Sorry, yeah. You said the kiln capes are are better than like the strength cape individually, because oh, definitely, boost. okay. Yeah. Does yeah, the max definitely. cape include the kiln capes? I don't even. Nope, nope. Oh, the that's what, that's the kiln capes, kiln capes are better than the max cape. I use a max cape both because I get the three perk slots and also because it's just a lot more effort to uh, to bring a cape sw switch for Slayer. Yeah. I think um, obviously, if you have a comp cape, it's best in slot in every conceivable way, so use that. And the last one that's good for Slayer is the Magic Cape. 
Uh, it allows you to spell book swap at any bank, um, which is kind of nice, uh, especially it makes it more convenient to do Muzpa. Obviously, you could go switch to zero spells at the altar right there, but you know it, it still saves you a little bit of time, and mostly it just saves you the hassle of always having to go to Prif or to use magic switchers, uh, which is an invention item that's quite expensive. So, like I said, I would use the invention cape and attack cape on your max cape when using Slayer, um, and then the Dungeoneering cape, Slayer cape, magic capes. What I would put those, put two of the three in the inventory and have the other one always. All right, awesome. Well, that wraps that up, and now we go ahead and move on to armor types here. Um, the first type of armor we have, of course, is tank armor, and I kind of mainly have this here. I'm guessing there's not really a place in Slayer this has a use, but I, I basically have this here as a way for us to discuss, you know, the fact of the matter of, about tank armors and how they are generally used incorrectly by PVMers. I was definitely guilty of this up until like eight months ago or so, where, you know, you think the defensive boost is going to help your survivability, so you go ahead and use that. But, you know, I guess I'll let you explain it in detail here. Yeah, essentially, uh, there are almost no places in the game where it's worth using tank armor. Uh, tank armor does not improve your DPS at all. The way to save food is to get better at doing dps so the way that you get the way that you end up using less food is you do more damage and soul split your damage back uh, and so if you want to improve your survivability use dps based armors uh, and the only situation where tank armor is useful is for set effects so the set effect of acto armor is good at places like telos or basing raids because your defensives go back on cooldown, but they're not used because tank armor is good, but instead because they provide that specific set effect. Uh, and also you improve damage with a shield, which is useful. Uh, aside from those two instances, uh, facing raids and Telos phase five, uh, there's basically no place in the game where tank armor is as good as DPS armor. Now here's something I've kind of wondered about uh, power armor or DPS armor, whichever you call it specifically. Um, power, uh, power armor is the proper name. So we yeah, use that. the the boost that it gives you is that like a straight like plus level boost, or how does like that boost actually like apply to please so, character? Okay, so the easiest way to explain this: every weapon has uh, ability damage and accuracy. Power armor is a flat addition to your ability damage or also called weapon damage so the higher your weapon damage the higher you'll have the higher your accuracy the more accurately you are uh, those are the two modifiers that they make the core of uh, dps all right cool uh, next we will move on here we have a uh, hybrid armor uh the first one we have here listed to cover is the Solisca hybrid armor so i'll let you kind of cover that yeah, so Solskate's tier 80. It does not provide a boost to DPS like Power Armor does. It, however, provides quite good defense and is useful for all three styles and that it doesn't hamper your accuracy for any style. Uh, the advantages to Solskate Armor are that, one, it, does, it means that you never have to switch styles when you're switching styles for Slayer. So you could actually just make a Slayer preset uh, and just use that and you don't have to waste time fiddling with what your armor is. Second, is many of the better perk combinations are either quite rare or very expensive to get. So it would be unrealistic to get some of them on all three styles or two styles. And so simply putting best in slot Slayer perks on Sliske armor is often thought to be better damage and probably is in fact much better damage than having inferior perks spread across three different styles. So that's kind of the reason to do it. I think that if you are very wealthy and can afford both the time, effort, and money it would require to get best in slot perks for all three styles, I would do that. But tier 75 armor is so cheap uh, that it almost seems like a waste to put it on that. I would almost, at that point, if you have that much money, just get all three mechs armor sets and just put max perks on all three of your next sets for slayer uh, but if you want to save some money and still be very efficient the 
Sliske armor with the Tuska's War Priest set effect essentially gives it a DPS boost, so it's as if you have Biting 3, but it's free. Uh, and it also almost acts as like a, a fifth perk slot on your armor because you're basically getting a Biting boost. Um, and so, and yeah, so I think I think that I'm coming around to the idea that the most efficient Slayer setup is to use Sliske armor with the Tuska's War Priest set effect and just put best in slot max perks on your Sliske armor and just use that for Slayer. That's interesting. I may have to consider that. I still haven't built my armor. Um, and then yeah. the next set of high other oh, Go ahead. The one, sorry, the one thing, though, is that I'd have to look this up, but it's possible the Tusk of War Priest set effect doesn't work with the armor if you're just using two pieces. In fact, I think that's probably the case. Uh, so it's actually not quite as good as I just suggested. Um, and you probably don't actually need the Tuska's War Priest armor, but I still think that in terms of efficiency uh, and being realistic about how much money you're spending, if money's not an object, so scale armor is definitely not as good. But if money is a concern, but you still want to maximize your efficiency, uh, it is arguable that Sliske armor with max perks is the best way to go. And I'll talk about what I do a little bit later because I do something that I think might be even better than that, but still be affordable. Uh, but it also is more complicated and a little bit annoying to manage and deal with. So, uh, yeah. What were you saying, Harley? All right. Well, just the next hybrid armor we have listed here is one that I added, which is the Ghost Hunter armor. Uh, this is armor that you earn randomly picking up from ghosts and when you have three or more pieces it gives a 10 percent increase to the amount of damage that you do to ghosts now this is something that's really not going to be useful at like a super high level i mean i guess maybe if you're killing revenants that'd be something that would be useful but this is mainly for people who are leveling up you know 299 slayer because it, it's super useful against stuff like spiritual rangers or spiritual mages which are pretty good tasks when you're a slightly lower level plus uh good money makers so if you just want to camp somewhere afk for money ghost hunter is a good thing to wear of course it's not actually you know augmentable so you you know are not you're losing a lot of perks on this so it has it's, it's it's very niche in what it can do but if you don't have augmented armor you're like i said where you're going for 99 this can be a nice thing to just give you a dps boost against ghosts yeah absolutely that's a good idea i haven't even thought about that but but definitely for lower level slayers you don't have a lot of money that'd be pretty good because uh, you should be doing lots and lots and lots of spiritual creatures at that level yeah and then the last set here that I have is Void. And kind of kind of the main reason I just have a mention for this is just for the fact that Void is free. Uh, sure, it takes time to unlock, but if you've already put that time in, you know, it is free. It is It was best-in-slot DPS armor until invention happened, and now it's not because it's not augmentable anymore. But I feel like it's still kind of worth a mention just for the fact that if you have it and you want to, you know, be cheap about it, it's a very good choice to go with. I have a friend who is doing next, uh, camping next right now for the pet. And uh, in order to basically make his costs for going for the pet zero, he just uses Void like the old days. Uh, and it's still really good. Uh, it's not great for Slayer because you can't use it with the Slayer helmet, obviously. But for many bosses uh, and for camping some of those bosses, especially if you're not going for records or you're doing more casual kills, Void is still super useful. Yeah. I and I, I honestly kind of hope that someday they make void augmentable. I guess it would kind of, you know, make it voidscape again, but I'm I'm personally yeah, kind oh, of yeah. okay with that. I would I would love a new tier of void to make it augmentable so people have to go back to, you know, um the mini games and earn it, but I don't know. To me that would be a fantastic update. Yeah, I I I think the the counter to that is that it would uh it would make the price of a lot of the the better armors which are made from drops from bosses go go down quite a lot but you know it'd be a trade-off it'd be interesting yeah i mean who knows how much they'd actually go down because they were still pretty expensive when void when it was voids i mean they're definitely oh sure more sure. expensive yeah anyways and the the last bit of arm we have to talk about is power armor and i'll we'll let you cover this topic because you are yeah, gonna be the most efficient at that so Power Armor basically starts with God Wars Dungeon 1, so uh, Armadale, subject of uh, Bandos Armor. 
Uh, the next tier is next armors, so Torva, Pernix, Virtus, and then the God Wars Dungeon 2 armors. Uh, God Wars Dungeon 2, of course, has the refined armors, which gets you tier 85 power armor. The upgraded ancient equipment at tier 88, and then, of course, your tier 90 power armors are the ones that degrade to dust. So, for Slayer specifically, what I would recommend if you're not going the Sliske route is to you just have all three sets of the tier 75 armor that's non degradable. Um, obviously, you mean tier 85? Willing... Mm, no, 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 no. T- tier 75, the not not degradable at all. Well, then, so, like, they well, you those... mean 70 That's oh, it's tier 70. Yep. Okay, I thought they changed it to tier 75, but but fair enough. I guess it's tier 70 armor then. So, the, the tier 70 armors uh, from God Wars Dungeon. Uh, they're cheap, relatively. They're not degradable. You don't have to worry about um, recharging them, uh, and their drain rate in terms of their cost for invention is extremely low. Uh, I think that it's arguable the next armors are worth getting. Um, they're much more expensive. They have a drain, much higher drain rate, or they will degrade, and you have to repair them. Now, what about the uh, next boots, armors yeah. mixed with the God Wars 2 armor? Because the God Wars 2 armor at base is not degradable, right? So if you got those three pieces and mixed it with next armor, would that would that save you some? Well, because you would be augmenting them anyways, the drain rate is the same for tier 80 power armor across the board. So there's no... The, there's no reason really to use the God Wars Dungeon 2 armors instead of next armors. Because next armors might be slightly more expensive, uh, but they have the advantage of giving you a prayer bonus, which is kind of nice for Slayer, as well as a life point bonus, which is nice for other reasons. Um, and so, because you'll be augmenting them either way, there's the drain rate is the same, so it doesn't save you money to use the tier eighty God Wars Dungeon two one. Uh, that is fair enough. Makes sense to me. Now, I also, yep. I mean, of course, if you want to, I think min max it you're gonna go for t90 right it's expensive oh, to- because you're yes. gonna because it's a grades per hit in case you don't know that but if money is no option t90 is your friend yes uh the caveat to that is that a set of tier 80 armor with the best slayer specific perks is significantly more dps than a tier 90 armor with traditional pbm perks so if you want to use tier 90 they would require you to make a second set of tier 90 armors and put all of the slayer relevant perks on there because next armor because even tier 70 armor even subjugation with genocidal and demon slayer that will do more damage than tectonic armor that doesn't have genocidal or demon slayer armor. uh when obviously that's you know, when going against the uh, so really Tier 90 armor is only good if there are no Slayer specific perks available or if you have a second set of Tier 90 armor that you're using just for Slayer, which is you know, you're even more more dice than the scope of, of this podcast. Because I think at that point, you're spending so much money at for doing Slayer that your, your efficiency equation won't really work out well for you. Uh, at, least, at least that's my, my um, you're, you're thinking with T90s that is? Yeah, with tier 90s you'd be spending so much money for such a insignificant boost to damage that I can't conceive any place in the game where you can make enough money to make that work. So, so. But, you know, if you have I mean, if you have infinite wealth though by all means, use, use tier 90 armor with the best in slot perks, it's obviously the best. Uh, but if you aren't rolling in party hats <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, that sums up the armor discussion. Okay, that is going to wrap up part one of our 120 Slayer guide. We will be releasing part two here very soon afterwards. We'll be talking about how to get to 99 plus how to, you know, train it to the 120 min maxi and every method that you can possibly do, things like that. So thank you very much for listening to our first episode.